And now we have our second invited speaker, Brandon Rhodes. Um, Brandon is a fellow of the Python Software Foundation and was the conference director for PyCon US 2016 and 2017 in Portland. I first heard Brandon on a cassette tape. <laughs> Django Con Europe 2016, every attendee had a lanyard that was made of a cassette tape. And if you could find a cassette tape player in Budapest, which we couldn't, um, you would be able to listen to Brandon to, uh, speak about, uh, he recited a part of the appendix of one of the books from The Lord of the Rings. <laughs> and since then, I've always wanted to see Brandon speak live. Sadly, we both travel a lot, so we never really were able to get in the same place at the same time. So I thought, hey, I'm running a conference, let's just bring him over here. So. <laughs> It gives me so much pleasure to be able to welcome Brandon Rhodes. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you so much for the invitation. It resulted in uh, this, my very, very first ever visit to Australia, which I had heard so much um, about, thanks to the Mad Max franchise. <laughs> I suppose there's two kinds of, of tourists, the ones who've seen Crocodile Dundee. I'm one of the ones that saw Mad Max. <laughs> so what else could I choose as, as my topic besides the Antipodes? One of those surprising words that has more syllables than it appears because it's Greek. Um, I guess this is for some of you. Uh, those of you who learn by reading and don't, don't hear uh, things for the first time, like me, uh, this is like that moment in a uh, fourth Harry Potter book where she had to insert an exchange student from Russia so that Hermione could pronounce her name for him, leading to all my friends going, oh, since they had pronounced it differently to that moment. So I will talk for a few minutes about the Antipodes. Uh, two uh, things put together, ante and podes, feet. Ancient Greek for the anti-feet people, whose feet pointed in the opposite direction from our own. Uh, there's a wonderful diagram in the Wikipedia, uh, if you look up the slides later, here's a link to it, uh, which graphs um, the, the concept that from any given spot you're standing in, there might be people on the opposite side of the earth standing with their feet pointing right up towards yours. If, if you could see through the earth, you might look down and see their feet pointing back at you. Now, this actually turns out to be more rare than you would hope uh, because our planet's mostly made of water. And so if you ask, what's on the other side of the world from almost anywhere, the Pacific is generally. <laughs> uh, and you can actually see from this, Australia's a bit contrarian. You're opposite the Atlantic. But as you can see from the, the uh, this is a, uh, fun to study later to see the few places where there are in fact a literal antipodes land on the opposite side of the earth from you. The ancient Greeks didn't have a globe. How did they arrive at the concept of the antipodes? Conjecture. <laughs> that is the main mechanism they had for generating knowledge. Uh, there's a great quote about conjecture, which is not often enough uh, quoted. The Mississippi River, this is a small section of it from a 1900s survey. Uh, the Mississippi River, like many silt-laden rivers in the world, is constantly, through the silt that precipitates out, filling up whatever channel it's uh, flowing in this decade, kind of flopping over to another channel, filling it up and constantly finding whatever the low spot is in its river valley and making sure it dumps silt there next. This is uh, someone with, with uh, traditional survey tools just mapping the previous few centuries of Mississippi uh, channels that you could see in the ground as little lakes and bayous and mushy places uh, as it had swapped locations in its course. Uh, in that era, as people were beginning to manage the river, it was beginning to get straighter. So the writer, Mark Twain, saw an opportunity to do science. Oh, that's a good look. <laughs> he said this, in the space of 176 years, 
the lower Mississippi has shortened itself 242 miles. Therefore, any calm person can see that in the old Oolitic Silurian period, just a million years ago next November, <laughs> the lower Mississippi River was upwards of 1.3 million miles long. And 742 years from now, the lower Mississippi will be only one and three quarters miles long, and Cairo, Illinois, and New Orleans will have joined. <laughs> there is something fascinating about science. One gets such wholesale returns of conjecture from such a trifling investment of fact. <laughs> conjecture was how the Greeks arrived at many of their beliefs about the world. And of course, if you read about the bleeding edge of any science, you know we're not done yet. One of the important Greek sources of conjecture was their deep, deep expectation of symmetry. For instance, they knew that the world was round. They'd measured its size to within a few percent. Would the weather be temperate at Greece's latitude, but in the southern hemisphere? Well, an argument from symmetry, sun should be at about the same angle in the sky there, would say yes. So without even going there, they have one answer. Would there be both land and water? Or would perhaps the southern hemisphere be an enormous ocean or an enormous continent? Well, we expect nature to be symmetrical. So would there be both land and water? Yes. We can know that by symmetry. Would there be plants and animals? Or would a continent in the south be a wasteland? Well, we can see in the northern hemisphere that every ecosystem is full of both plants and animals. Nature would, yes, have done the same thing there. Would there be humankind? Peoples whom we could never meet walking around on the lower hemisphere of the Earth. Well, you can look around Greece and see that not only are all of the biomes of the European land mass full of people, they're full of people that looked designed to live in the northern forests. Different people that looked designed to live in the, the, the edge of Arabia and so forth. If the northern hemisphere was full of people designed for each area, surely, yes, nature would also have fully populated the southern continents. I mean, it's kind of amazing that they were right, given that they had to take four completely unwarranted steps to get there. But like, yes, ancient Greek person, you're totally right. There are people down there. All right, but there was a problem, a sort of epistemological problem, which is that you never meet Antipodeans at dinner parties. Like, if there were thousands of people living on the other side of the earth, why haven't they ever came uh, and visited? So they answered that question why with a theory called the theory of the zones, that the, each hemisphere had a frigid zone, which would kill you. I mean, it was a try visiting Iceland. Uh, a temperate zone, Greece, somewhere pleasant. And then a torrid zone near the equator that would kill you with the, the heat and then finally the burning fire that must cover the equator. Um, I, myself, um, as a child, kind of had an incorrect, so I, as a child, I did not appreciate how far from the equator Greece is, which is sort of important to understand, uh, understand you know, their, their extrapolation as they tried to imagine the uh, equatorial zone. In my head, as a child, I kind of related different lands by their climate. Spain and Greece, I saw in pictures that these were warm and pleasant places you might vacation. So I thought they'd be roughly even with Florida. Southern France has agriculture and grapes, maybe the equivalent of North Carolina, and, and so all the way up to, well, I've heard that Glasgow gets snow. Maybe it's kind of even with Maine. That's kind of how I had things figured out. I was wrong. I was rather shocked uh, years ago when uh, the Washington Post, here's a link to it if you look at the slides later, um, published an image that is the Americas, with the beaches color-coded to show you what's across the ocean. 
this, uh, look it up later when you can look at it full size. It bears very careful uh, scrutiny. You can learn something from each line, including how many countries I didn't know the name of. Um, but the principal thing, I immediately looked at the East Coast near where I live, and I was shocked to learn that I had been off by 10 degrees. I'd expected Europe to be about the same distance from the equator as the place that I lived. But in fact, Spain and Greece are apart from Pennsylvania, which has rather hard winters. Southern France, with all of its grapevines, is across from Maine, known primarily for its winters. What's even across from northern France or Glasgow, Denmark? Well, across from northern France is the north shore of an island named Newfoundland whose north coast is locked in ice half the year, but the winter, your summer. <laughs> What's across from Glasgow? Tiny Inuit fishing villages are the last bits of civilization which cling to the channels of, of ocean in northern Canada that, again, freeze over with Arctic ice every winter. So uh, the general difference here is whether you are on the side of a continent where the air blows in from the ocean, pretty warm, or whether, uh, like the east coast of the United States, you're on the side of the continent where you're getting the air that has come across the continent at you. Um, there used to be an old rumor that something called the Gulf Stream caused this, but no, tiny ribbons of warm water in an ocean don't affect whole continents. This exact same thing without a Gulf Stream happens on the west coast of the United States. Portland, Seattle, Vancouver have very mild climates, despite being up at like Newfoundland levels of, of, of latitude. And the extreme cold of the eastern United States in winter is echoed in the climate off of Siberia. Uh, so this happens on both uh, major northern continents. So if Greece is not 30 degrees, but 40 degrees from the equator, almost halfway up the globe. What is south of it as the obstacle that they had in front of them if they wanted to go take a look at the equator? Well, if you go down to the level of North Carolina, it's Tunisia, literally Tatooine. <laughs> you need moisture evaporators just to live there, right? Um, south of that, Cairo and the Sahara, and as you go south, Sahara, Sahara, for <laughs> thousands of kilometers. Um, and in fact, if a Greek person had wanted to start in Cairo, cross the desert, in their heads they would have said, well, I'm going to have to go from 30 degrees north to 30 degrees south before I emerge, presumably, from this global desert. That's 6,500 kilometers of desert. No wonder they thought they could extrapolate that this was an impassable region through which no one could travel. Spoiler alert, there's, there's, there's no burning global desert at the equator. Um, I, as a child, just like the Greeks, would, would have assumed so. If you'd have shown me this map of Africa and said, draw the equator, I would have put it right through the Sahara. I would have thought that the hottest desert area was where the sun was directly overhead. In fact, the equator goes through the greenest part of this satellite image um, through the, um, you know, the, the forests of the Congo. Uh, so in this instance, the Greeks were wrong. The uh, central region is not impassable. Uh, it, in fact, is tropical and green and, and full of living things uh, the whole world across. But they didn't know that, and so that 6,500 kilometers of desert provided a plausible explanation for the isolation of the peoples of the South that they could hypothesize but never expected to visit. This let the Greeks re retain their belief in nature's symmetry while explaining why you never see Antipodeans at parties. Now, this theory had rational consequences going forward many, many uh, centuries um, because it caused debates. Um, in the late Roman Empire, uh, once the theory of the Antipodes was hundreds of years old, um, certain religions began to arise based on ancient Jewish texts. These texts had a conflicting theory, what I'll call a, a theory of common descent. They hypothesized 
not that each region had its own independent group of humans. These ancient texts hypothesized that all humans were a single family, that had come from a single mom and dad. Now, clearly, if humans all came from a single mom and dad, there could be no humans in the southern hemisphere. There would have had to be a second Adam and Eve. The books don't mention a second Adam and Eve, so major world religions in the late Roman Empire began to debate this theory of the Antipodes because it contradicted the idea that all humans are related to one another. That's what happened with the scientific theory, not formally being resolved until Henry the Navigator developed Portuguese ships that could finally pass the equator. But it also, this idea of the Antipodes, had imaginative consequences. Poets began using the idea in their poetry. Comedies would have in Rome and Greece, characters wonder if they'd walked so far that they were now in the Antipodes. And it gave Greeks their first taste of a relativistic concept. Because as you, the philosopher, at the moment that you were writing a speculation about the Antipodes, it occurred to you there could be a philosopher down there at that very moment writing about you. And while the Antipodean was an exotic unknown that you would never meet, you were the exotic unknown to that Antipodean. It was one of their first encounters with a concept where you realize that you are the Antipodean as much as the other person. So, I'm going to uh, use that idea, that idea that maybe sometimes I'm the one who's upside down, to explore a few different ideas. And I am not primarily, as I explore that idea, going to emphasize technological ideas. Um, I've done that before. Here, when you look at the slides later, is a link to one of my talks about the clean architecture. An antipode, an idea that our instinct as a programmer is that I always try to hide I.O. at the lowest level of my application, which has a terrible, terrible result. It leaves the I.O. coupled with everything up to and including the main function, right? If main, always when called, calls a subroutine, and always calls a helper, that always then tries to go and do I.O., nothing in this application can be tested without what? creating a database first or whatever. Um, and so go see those talks if you're interested in the idea of putting the I.O. up at the top level. Your main routine gets all of the databases and everything else set up, leaving the business logic beneath it more agnostic about where data is coming from and going to. Another technical direction, uh, but I've already given talks about that. Another direction is I could talk about, I sometimes write my Python modules upside down. Like, where in a module should main go, or whatever the primary API of the module is? I kind of think maybe it should go at the top, so that when you open the module, try to refresh your memory on what it is, you can see the main point. Unfortunately, a number of us learned programming first in a language called C, which if you put main at the top and the helper routine at the bottom, Helps, helpfully gives you an error, conflicting types, because if it sees a function as it's compiling that has not been defined yet, it assumes integer arguments and integer return values, and then gives you an error when it gets further down and finds that they're actually, in this case, floats. In C, you could fix this by doing what's called a forward declaration, where without committing yourself to what the body of the function looks like, you at least provide its arguments and return value, but then you're having to repeat yourself. Programmers don't like repeating themselves. And so uh, the common solution was simply to write things upside down. All the helper functions first, then the actual point of the module. A habit uh, given to those of us who used to be C programmers that then led us in many cases to come to Python and do exactly the same thing. Write entire modules upside down. And I could find lots of other examples of technical upside-downness when I find myself standing on my head. But instead of talking about architecture or modules, 
I want to talk about a personal upside-downness, which is how I enact personal communication. This really came to my attention, I had to address it, when I was several years ago the volunteer chair of PyCon when the uh, conference was in Portland, whose climate is somewhat warmer than you would expect because it's next to the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> It was very pleasant. Um, being a conference chair turned me into a supplier of a limited conference resource, decisions. I now had to supply them by the gross. How, you might ask, do I make a decision? Well, one, after receiving the email, I wait one day or longer. It turns out, then I sit down and I reply to an email. So the problems with this. First, making people wait. As I got into the swing of things as a chair, I adopted a guiding principle. I don't know if it's literally true, but it was a good guide to behavior. A volunteer, speaking of one of the other volunteers, waiting for my answer, is in pain. I don't know if they all really were, but if you've ever had to stop because you realize you can't make the decision you need in order to go forward, you put together the best email you can, you hit send to someone else, like it's not always pleasant to be left sitting and waiting and waiting and checking your email or going to do something else. You can't move forward in many cases until you get that answer. So I adopted the assumption that a volunteer waiting for my answer was in some kind of discomfort. That maybe I shouldn't wait that long before replying. So wait one day. Turns out I wasn't waiting one day when I was honest because it usually made my answer any better. I would just wait one day and then write the same answer I would anyway. I was waiting one day because I was a coward. Because I didn't want to decide yet because it was risky to make a decision. It might be unpopular, it might be flawed. And so I had to fight my instinct to just always wait a little longer, hoping the decision would suddenly become an easy one. It never did, if I just waited a few more hours. So, I really tried to stop waiting one day, either immediately reply, or at least immediately start writing it up, because I might discover I don't have enough information to answer. Always better to discover that and start the process of finding out those answers that I need early rather than late when people are already, uh, already waited a few days for an answer. All right, now to step two, replying to the email. Well, what should we do about this PyCon issue? Well, consideration number one, and I would start writing a big paragraph about one consideration which impacted the answer. Then I would talk my way through another consideration. Then I would realize there was another facet and go for a third one. Then I might even spend a few paragraphs on point number four before finally and sagely nodding my head and making a decision. Yeah. If waiting is, for the reader, painful, shouldn't my answer come first in the email? I realized after, after assembling a few of these. Why do I put the arguments first and the decision last? Well, one is that the first draft of an email usually is uh, sort of chronological. I'm, I'm going through the ideas in that order and not reaching the decision until I do. I usually think of the arguments first, then realize what decision I'm going to make. But I also do it in that order because the arguments are my defense. I don't like people to know my opinion until I'm surrounded with a fortress of rationale. So I would write the email. I would go down to the decision and cut and paste it up to the top so that the person, before wading through my many, many paragraphs of considerations, 
starts out knowing where I'm going, knowing what decision I'm heading towards, and knowing where they stand, and knowing where they're going to have to go next because of the decision. Uh, in putting the decision first, I was deciding to be vulnerable, to let them see it before they had seen all of my reasons. So I had to ask a question. Where could I find the courage to put my decision out there to put it first? The trick that I used, I kid you not, is rather than imagining my own voice reading the email as I typed and reviewed it, I imagined it being read in the voice of Commander Adama <laughs> from BSG. And it worked. They sounded great. Oh, I just remembered that moment near the opening of the miniseries where they want to put network computers aboard his old ship that's being mothballed and retired. And he says, it's an integrated computer network. And I will not have it aboard this ship. <sighs> Adopting that gravelly, decisive voice helped me avoid burying my decisions beneath too deep an avalanche of reasons. Uh, side note, you might think, Brandon, you're doing a lot of editing here to your emails. I never compose conference email in Gmail. Never compose a high stakes email in an application with a send button. Um, also, Gmail doesn't do Markdown, so I did this. I go to my editor, I'd write a reply in Markdown, highlight it, control C, copy. Then I had a little, uh, I had a hotkey that would run a shell script I wrote that pulls the plain text that I've just put in the copy buffer, runs it through Pandoc to produce HTML, and don't put that back into the text slash plain paste buffer, then you'll be sending HTML visibly in your Gmail. Put it into the text HTML uh, slot of the operating system's copy paste buffer, and you will be pasting correctly marked up, bolded and italic text into Gmail. Uh, this both let me easily type uh, attractive emails and also made sure that I didn't accidentally send any of them prematurely. So having put the reader first and put, begun to put what they needed at the top, I developed two more habits. Um, up above the decision, I would f try to start with thanks. They might not like the decision, but I could start by saying, thank you for bringing this to my attention. This does impact the whole conference or impact every um, volunteer. Thank them for bringing this to me so that we could make a good decision that was conference-wide before going on with what I thought the resulting decision needed to be. And then before getting into my long list of reasons, providing the next steps, the actions that they would want to go do next, both in order to get uh, the situation resolved, and sometimes also to say, this could go the other way next year. It's too late in the process this year to change the rule for volunteers or to change the rule for sponsors. But I could see this happening in a future year. Here are next steps for what you could do to build a case for how we do this in the future. Having provided so much useful information, I would look kind of embarrassedly at all of the considerations I'd written out and usually delete about half of them before sending the email, streamline it to the important stuff, not everything in the blizzard of reasons which I, with which I had attempted self-defense. And so this is kind of what the email would look like when turned upside down and trimmed up to what really the reader needed. Is there a bigger pattern here? I would describe it this way. I naturally tend to draft communications in the following form. Me, 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 you. <laughs> and the essential technique I had to learn was to try to turn that on its head. You, you, me, me, me. I tend to draft things with myself in mind, then I need to do some editing and work to make them what the other party needs. 
Now, I'm going to use an example. Email would be too big for the time we have remaining, so let's look at the task of writing a single tweet that I wrote a week or two ago and put on my Twitter account. The uh, reason for this is I received a thank you email that said yesterday's NASA astronomy picture of the day was made possible by Python, an old um, astronomy library I maintain for Python. Uh, the galactic core of our galaxy is hidden by dust, but is visible to radio telescopes. Um, and so a new array of radio telescopes that have just come online started out by imaging the galactic core, part of the sky about two degrees by one degree in size, about 1,000 by 500 light years, and this is what they saw at the center of our galaxy. The, the tight uh, SGRA, Sagittarius A, a radio source there on the right, is the actual center where we believe a supermassive black hole uh, sits at the center of the galaxy. And we don't understand most of the, I mean, think those are filaments hundreds of light years long. How do you light up a several hundred light year filament with, with, with radio energy? We don't know what processes are at work uh, creating especially that big arc. You might see it labeled to the left. Anyway, fascinating image. Um, you'll, you'll, it'll look even better on your screen at home if you go look, up, uh, look it up there. But an old library I maintain was part of uh, the South Africans, uh, the, the South African telescope array, um, getting online and getting pointed in the right direction. It's called the Meerkat Array, which in the standard of physicists is both an acronym for the kind of radio telescope it is, and also, of course, is the name of the Meerkat, a uh, animal in uh, native to South Africa. This is a mob of meerkats. That's the correct plural. So they sent me this email. Uh, there, there's some, if you want to go look at those images in more detail, the slides have links. So I drafted the beginning of a tweet. PyEFIM was used to create today's NASA picture of the day, link and image, and I thought I was almost done. But I stopped and decided to do a little editing. Here are eight improvements <laughs> that I made to the draft. First, I decided to provide context. After all, what's Pi-Ephim? Why am I tweeting about it? Not everybody, even readers of my Twitter account, would know all of the libraries I'd written over the years. So I added these words, my Pi-Ephim library was used to create, thereby both quickly explaining why I was particularly interested, um, I am the maintainer, and also library, what it is, a piece of software you use in your own projects. Uh, so already making it a more informative tweet. Second, I found it's important on Twitter to make modest claims about one software. Twitter seems particularly sensitive about that. Was used to create might lead people to go look at the, the, the library expecting pretty pictures to come out if they run it. All the library prints out is numbers. It's just how you aim the telescope. It was other software they used to make that beautiful picture. So I switched to library helped produce. Make its role a little more modest than in the initial language I'd come up with. Third, well, let's expand this into a narrative. I'm kind of at the moment coming out with this as just sort of a fact I suddenly know. Um, but how did I know about the photo? I mean, it's not like I personally monitor the NASA photo of the day for photos that use my library. I don't creep on the NASA photo of the day. <laughs> we have 280 characters these days. Let's tell the full story. I just got a thanks email letting me know that. And now it's a little more of a story. Now I'm supplying information about how I know this interesting fact about the NASA picture of the day, instead of making it look like I somehow knew that on my own. Next, I decided to offer, cre offer credit to the email's author. I just got a thanks email from Elude and the Meerkat team. Notice until this moment, there's been no credit given to the group that produced the image and runs the radio telescopes. By including that little phrase, I'm now hopefully putting the attention on the team that produced the image. 
fifth, I mean, I could emote a little bit, right? I could offer my own thoughts and feelings instead of letting that bare exclamation point try to carry the weight of my response to seeing the core of my galaxy for the first time, you know? So, because uh, so far the tweet leaves my own reaction implicit rather than explicit. So, because you know it's a nice image. So, I, I threw in, I took the exclamation point off the, the initial sentence and moved it over to an additional little stunning work, Meerkat, again to at the end of the tweet pull the attention back to that team and my excitement about what they'd accomplished. I might have stopped there, <laughs> but looking at the tweet, it was kind of all about me. And I might or might not unfollow people, all of whose tweets are kind of about them. Like if you're an HTML expert, I'm probably following you more for the HTML. Um, and, and so I thought, how can I bring in the uh, audience here? Let's invite the audience to become part of this cycle of thanks of which the email I received was one instance. Stunning work, Meerkat. Remember to thank the authors of open source projects you use. When I added that, I felt that the tweet now said everything I wanted to say. It, um, it now drew a larger lesson and wasn't just a tweet about something nice that happened to me. Let's step back. How does the tweet look? I would argue it looks upside down, even Antipodean, because where have I put the audience? At the very bottom, like I always do. Me, 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 you. Let's put the audience first. This will both make the tweet stronger because it leads now with a general principle and follows up with this specific example. Remember to thank the authors of open source projects you use. I just got a thanks email. And now it's about a big process that all of us are part of, thanking each other for the projects that make what we do possible. And then I flow into the story about this great thing that happened to me, now that it's a part of something that you too are also, you the audience, are also part of. This promotes the general pattern, the practice of giving thanks, as the most important part of the tweet. Finally, I realized I needed to switch to telling myself what to do. Remember to thank the authors of open source projects you use. That's awful. It sounds judgy. It's assuming the audience isn't doing that already, probably better than I do. And it's preachy. It's me telling them what to do. How can I fix this? Well, there's a really neat rule about being human. Anything you do will be interpreted as judging everyone who does something else. It's part of what makes being human so entertaining. All you have to do is state a habit of your own. I always add doc strings. <laughs> My projects still support 2.7. I use Emacs. And the great thing is, Technically, you've just made a statement about yourself. Everyone knows you've attacked them. <laughs> Instead of remember to thank the authors, this imperative verb dictating things to my audience, I should take more time to thank the open source projects I use. I should take more time, both sounds humble, submitting that I need to work on this and I'm not perfect, while still implying that everybody else should do it. <laughs> I now knew, having been turned on its head in two different ways, that the tweet was ready. It's no longer upside down, but right side up. I should take more time to thank the open source projects I use. I just got a thanks email from Elude and the Meerkat team letting me know that my PyEFIM library helped produce today's NASA picture of the day. Stunning work, Meerkat. Always remember. Before you hit tweet, do remember to attach the image. <laughs> Thank you very much.
I learned so much. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. That was everything I was hoping it would be. Thank you for the opportunity.